I enjoyed uh, our time this morning, and I pray that um, tonight we'll just continue to let God speak. Uh, we finished up in our uh, series this morning on coming soon and Jesus coming again, and, and uh, what, a, what a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. I'm just looking for him any time. You know, it seems like this old world just gets more difficult as the days go on. You know what? You got your Bibles? Go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews with that thought. Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're finding Hebrews chapter 11, I'll tell you a story. And I think I've told this before, but uh, I, I've, between here and work and the other places I get asked to come to, uh, I forget what I've told and where I've told it. So uh, I think I may have shared this with you, but I think it's worth sharing again if I have. And Jimmy, if I've already told this, just listen again, okay? Okay. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, when you find it, let's stand together. But there was a lady who asked her pastor over to her house one day she had found out she was terminal and she was dying and they were covering her funeral arrangements and uh, at the end of it all as the pastor was leaving the lady asked the pastor for one more thing and she said I want you to uh, when I'm in the casket I want you to put a fork in my hand and the pastor said well it's okay but that makes no sense to me and uh, the lady said well when I was a child we'd go to these little church socials and church functions and dinners and when they would serve the meal, it would be a wonderful meal. And when the meal was done, they would come and take our plates and they'd take the silverware, but they'd always leave the fork. And some little saint of God would bend over and say, there's better things coming. Keep your fork. And that's when the dessert would come out, the cobblers and the cakes and the pies and all that stuff. Well, I'm here tonight to tell you, church, there's better things ahead. There's better things to come. That's the thought on my heart tonight. We're going to do a little study in the book of Hebrews tonight, but we're going to start in the 11th chapter, and I want to look at verses 39 and 40. <clears throat> that is the last two verses of the 11th chapter. You know the 11th chapter is a study on faith, the heroes of faith, or champions of faith, or the hall of fame of faith. I've seen some Bibles label it, but tonight let's look at verse 39 and 40. If you got it, say amen. amen. After he finished talking and describing all of these champions of faith, the Bible says, and all these, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. And here's our thought. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not, uh, should not be made perfect. Father, tonight we stand in your presence and we thank you that you blessed us. Lord, we uh, uh, take for granted sometimes just how good you are to us. And Father, in the midst of all the trouble... Help us to see that there's better things ahead. Now, Father, I pray that you'll speak tonight through the power of your Spirit, that you'll use me as your vessel. Don't let me get in the way. Just let me say what you would say. And, God, we pray that you'll have your way with every heart tonight. Draw the lost to Christ. Draw the hurting to Jesus, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for standing with me. I want to preach tonight on what verse 40 said, some better thing. Isn't that good? God has provided some better thing. William Shakespeare is quoted as to saying, we've seen better days. <laughs> That's pretty good. He's not the only one to have said that. I think we've all said that. We've seen better days. Somebody once said that the good old days weren't so great. We better take a look at these days and try to make the best out of them. But the thing of it is, these days we're living in aren't that great either. It seems as though, like Job said, that man's days are full of trouble. We're just troubled on every hand. The Bible says we're perplexed, we're distressed. And life can get the better of us very quickly until, as a child of God, we're reminded that there's some better thing to come, that there's something better that God did for us. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is a study through the Old Testament, through the saints, and through the faith that they had. We're going to turn back a few chapters and just kind of uh, march right back through it and look at some of the better things that God says are waiting on us. And I'm thankful for that. Oh, those Old Testament prophets, they did the best they could. They lived by faith the best they could. They followed the, uh, the commandments the best they could. They were obedient the best they could. But even all of those, verse 39 says, they didn't receive the promise. That promise has been reserved. But thanks be to God, there's some better thing. And by the way, I'll just give you a shortcut to the end. That some better thing is Jesus. <laughs> that some better thing is Jesus. He's the one that the prophets looked to. He's the one that the prophets preached about. He's the one that all of history has been pointing to. He's the one that the Bible, no matter where you start to read it, no matter where you open it, the Bible will always point you to Jesus Christ. He is that better thing, and thank God for it. But uh, turn back with me, and, and we'll get back here to 
uh, Hebrews 11 in just a little while, in about six hours, okay? So just hang in there. Go back to the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews. I'm going to show you some better things that the Bible talks about that God is going to do through, or has done, through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19, it talks about a better hope. Now, Holt was just singing about that, and that's a great lead-in to the message, I think. It talks about a better hope. Look at chapter 7, verse 19. The Bible says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. Aren't you glad for a better hope? Aren't you glad for a hope that is not based in uh, what man can do? In the Old Testament, that's the only hope they had. They had a hope that the priest would do what he was supposed to do. They had a hope that the blood of the bulls and the goats and the rams and the turtle doves would be enough. Their hope was in how well man could keep what God had said. And I'm glad that God made a better way. I'm glad that God gave us a better hope. Billy Graham was quoted as to saying this, Our world today so desperately hungers for hope, yet uncounted people have given up. There is despair and hopelessness on every hand. Let us be faithful in proclaiming the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a true statement? We look around and we see hopelessness and despair on every corner. You know why? Because man's trying to be good. Man's trying to figure out how to be good and righteous. Michael Jackson wrote that song, Heal the World, and to bring hope to the world and, and to fix everything and to make the world a better place. Dear friend, our hope can't be in that. Our hope can't be in government and politics and music and relief efforts. Our hope must be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because hope, we talked about this already, but hope placed anywhere else is not hope at all. It's just a dream that's not going to come true. A nightmare, if you will. But there's a better hope. <laughs> and I thank God for that. Look what it says in verse 19 again. For the law made nothing perfect. That's strong. That's strong language. The law made nothing perfect. You know what that means? Nobody was able to keep the law. God set down the law as his uh, commands or his way that things should be done. How we should live. How we should treat each other. How we should treat him. And it made nobody perfect. And without perfection there is no seeing God. Can you imagine living in the Old Testament and trying to obtain this perfection? Oh, how stressful it would be. Oh, but God had a better way. He said he gave us a better hope. That word hope means confidence if you look it up. We might say it this way, a better confidence. And I've got confidence, but I don't have confidence in myself. Do you have confidence in me as your pastor? Shame on you. <laughs> Ron had the right answer. <laughs> hey, listen. Just because we attend this church does not mean we have a bypass to heaven. Just because that we read from the certain version of the Bible does not mean we have obtained a secret entrance into heaven and we don't have to worry about the rest of it. Your hope should not be in me. Your hope should not be in songs. Your hope should not be in doctrine. Your hope should be in Jesus Christ. And if our hope is in Christ, all the rest of it will fall into place. A better hope, a better confidence. In the Old Testament, they had to put confidence in the flesh. What a terrifying thing. <laughs> Their hope was in, can you imagine? looking at the high priest who's going in to make a sacrifice for you and worrying that he might die before he ever gets there. Here you've went and paid your money to buy the turtle dove, to buy whatever it is that you're sacrificing, to have that blood placed on the altar. And now your, <laughs> your fate, if you will, is put in the hands of a man who's got to be ceremoniously clean. He's got to check off all these boxes, and if he doesn't, when he walks in, to the holiest of holies, he struck dead. And they tie bells on him. That's where that saying, dead ringer, came from. If they stopped ringing, if the bells stopped ringing, they died. And they would literally pull them back out and send in the next one. That is terrifying. I, my hope, my confidence is not in man. Your confidence better not be in me. My confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your confidence needs to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only a better confidence, but um, if I flip over to chapter 8. Chapter 8. You know, when we talk about hope, in a world that's full of trouble, we ought to have faith like this little boy I heard about at a baseball game. This stranger rode into town and saw a little league baseball game going on, and he found a little boy sitting in the dugout, and he said, how's the game going, son? He said, well, it's 18 to nothing. We're down. And the guy said, boy, I bet that's got you pretty depressed. He said, oh, no, we hadn't got the bat yet. <laughs> That little boy had hope, didn't he? 
hope in the midst of a bad situation. Now you look at that and you think, man, that's getting your tail whooped right there. But that little boy saw hope. And friends, as Christians, that's what we have. In a world full of trouble, we have got something we can hold on to. Look, the devil might be up 18 to nothing, but Jesus ain't come to bat yet. Amen. Hey, the devil might be putting the hurting on us, but Jesus ain't stepped out yet. Hey, listen, the world and the and devil and all of his demons, boy, he'll have a heyday. Oh, he'll make us miserable. Oh, he'll make us suffer. Oh, but wait till Jesus steps out. All that will stop, amen. All that will end and it'll be our confidence won't be then in us. Our confidence will be in Jesus. Amen. Now look in chapter 8. Not only is there a better confidence, a better hope, if you will, but there's a better covenant. Chapter 8, verse 6, talks about this. But now hath he obtained, this is Jesus, a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon a better promise. We talk about this when we take of the Lord's Supper. There are two covenants. There's an old covenant and a new covenant. That word covenant means testament. There's two testaments in your Bible, an Old Testament and a New Testament. That Old Testament is in the blood of everything else. The New Testament is in the blood of Christ. When we take of the Lord's Supper, we're not taking the blood of animals. We're taking the juice in memory of the blood of Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews there's a better covenant. You remember in the Old Testament when they finished the temple? It says that they brought sacrifices by the hundreds, if not thousands, and they sacrificed animals. How long was it, Jimmy? Days, if I remember correctly. Hours upon, I think it was days they sacrificed animals after animals after animals after animals. Can you imagine that scene? Oh, it was nasty. It had to stink. It had to be a sight. It had to be something that repulsed so many people. It had to be something that when they looked at it, it was just... I can't believe this is what God wants. And if this is how we've got to be pleasing to God, we've got to do it. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So blood had to be shed. But can you imagine having to rely on that, having to constantly have that blood that was shed? That's the old covenant. But thank God for the new covenant, the new covenant in the blood of Christ. The Bible says there's no more sacrifices past Christ. Nothing else is needed anymore because his blood was sufficient. Turn over to chapter 9. Let me read this to you. Chapter 9, and let's start around verse number 11. Let's cover this. This is talking about the new covenant and the blood of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 11 says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, that's talking about a better day, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Ain't that good? Hey, listen, Jesus went in once for me and for you, and amen, that one time was enough. That blood was enough to cover us and seal us to the end. Verse 13 says, Forth the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge uh, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Isn't that beautiful? Hey, listen, what was all that saying? There's a better covenant. And we are partakers of a better covenant. In Hebrews chapter 11, it tells about the Old Testament saints. They had to rely on that blood of animals and goats and the ashes of the heifers that were sprinkled and all that ceremonial stuff. Friend, we've got a better covenant today because it doesn't matter about the blood of animals. It doesn't even matter about our blood. It's the blood of Jesus that matters. It's the blood of Jesus. Just like in Egypt when they had to sprinkle that uh, blood of that lamb without spot and blemish on the doorpost. So has the blood of the lamb without spot and blemish, Jesus Christ, been sprinkled, if you will, upon us. And we, well, we're Baptists. We better say baptized, shouldn't we? <laughs> it ain't been sprinkled. We've been baptized in the blood. Let's, let's do that. For our, uh, we'll make sure we cover up. But the blood has been applied to us. Now, what happened in Egypt when the blood was applied? It didn't matter anymore what was behind that door. It didn't matter the condition of the hearts behind that door, the attitudes, the works of the things behind that door, the faith of the even of the ones behind that door. All that mattered when that death angel came was the blood. Amen? And when it comes my time to die, there is but yet one thing that's going to matter, 
And it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that's going to matter. Somebody said one time, and I think this is good, that in heaven our names are written in the book. Yes, they're written, but they're sealed over with blood. Amen. I like that. Sealed over with the blood of Jesus Christ so that, no, uh, so that uh, nobody can mark that out. And then it goes on to say, verse 15 in chapter 9. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You know what we've got? A promise of eternal life. Now if that's not some better thing, I don't know what is. Wasn't it Paul that said, if in this life we have hope, we're most men miserable? And that's all the atheist really has. The agnostic, the unbeliever, the God-hater, the Christ-denier. All they have is the hope in this life. Is it any wonder we're trying so hard to make the world a better place to go to hell from? Have you seen it? Have you seen how hard we're working to make this world a better place? And the Jehovah's Witness will even tell you, oh, yes, this, there'll be peace on earth. No. The Bible says it's going to get worse. There'll not be peace on earth until the Prince of Peace comes. But we're trying so hard. Even our churches, they were trying to make the world a better place. We've stopped trying to influence the world. We're trying to be like them. And if we're going to be like them, then we've got to make the world a better place. Listen, the only thing that's going to make this world a better place is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world has nothing to offer the child of God. The world has nothing to offer the church. And that's why the Bible, I believe, teaches separation of the two. But what we're, but what we're seeing is uh, that we're trying to make it better, that we've forgotten that we've got a new way. That we've got a hope that goes beyond that. We've got a hope of everlasting life, eternal life with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, turn back, get back into chapter 11. We've looked at a better confidence. We've looked at a better covenant. And lastly, and I like this one. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16 talks about a better country. Hebrews 11 verse 16. Look at this. It says, but now they desire a better country. How about you? Do you desire a better country? I do. I desire home. There's been many people said it, but there's a, there's a song that uh, this says, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures and my hope are laid up far beyond the blue. This is not our final destination. My final destination is home. And it's going to be a better country. A country without war. A country without famine. A country without depression. A country without addiction. A country without prejudice. A country without racial divide. A, a, a country without political divide. A country without trouble. A country without doctors. And God love our doctors, but we won't need them when we get home. Amen. A country without pharmacies. Do you know there's a pharmacy every five feet you go? Everybody's on something. There's a country with no more pharmacies. The Bible tells us there's a country where there's no more light there. We don't need the sun and the moon anymore because Jesus is the light. The Bible says there's a better country waiting on us where the river of life flows through for the healing. And there's trees there for healing. Oh, a better place. A better country. That's what verse 16 says. But now they desire a better country. I hope you desire a better country. That is, it says, a heavenly, a heavenly country. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Did you know God did that for you? You thought God did that just for Jimmy, didn't you? Now, God loves Jimmy, and God's made Jimmy a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for Jimmy. But you know what else it said? I don't believe he said it quite like that to you, Jimmy. I believe he said, I go to prepare a place for you. You. Somebody said, if you were the only one, Jesus would have still died for you. And I like that. And I believe that. You know what I believe? I believe right now God is putting the finishing touches. Jesus is putting the final decorations in the mansions of glory. I think, and we've been talking about this, that time is very short. Whether we go through the air or go through the grave, one day I'm going. And this I know, I'm going home. I'm going to a better country. I've got a hope for a better country. Now, uh, go back again. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse uh, 10, talking about Abraham. Hebrews 11:10. 10. You've heard this verse before. The Bible says, But uh, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder 
and maker is God. Are you looking for that city? Boy, I am. I am. I'm ready to go home. You know, I'm ready to go home. But you know what the Lord seems to whisper when I ask him about that? Not time yet. Not time yet. I've told you this before, but had God answered that prayer 15 years ago, there'd be some people in this church who wouldn't be going to heaven. We've got to remember that. The long-suffering of God is wiser than the impatience of man. What does that mean? That means that God knows when the time will be up. And this I know. Whenever that time comes, I've got a home waiting on me. i got a better country. I might be a citizen of the United States, but more importantly to me, I'm a citizen of heaven. And one day I'm going to get to go there. Are you going to go with me? If the Lord comes for us tonight, are we going to go together? And we'll say, praise God, I'm going home. Going home, going home. There is nothing to hold me here. I've got a glimpse of the heavenly throne. Praise God, I'm going home. Hey, church, won't be long. Oh, there's a better hope. <laughs> it's not in the hope that man offers. It's not in the hope the world offers. It's the hope that only comes. In knowing Jesus Christ. There's a better confidence. There's a better covenant. Not in the blood of animals. Not in the works of man. But in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh and there's a better country waiting on us all. So church hang on. There's better days coming. And I like what he said there in Hebrews at the very end of that chapter. He said God having provided some better thing for us. How much does God love you? He loves you so much that he made a better way. Now we like to think Abraham and Moses and Samson and all those were God's favorites. David was a man after God's own heart. If you were to ask people who was God's favorite in the Bible, you'd probably pick one of those Old Testament saints, wouldn't you? But did you hear what I read to you a few minutes ago, that they didn't get the promise? They didn't get the better thing. They didn't live to see Jesus. But we did. We did. We got to see. Now we got to see that promise. We got to live in the age of the church where we can tell others that there's a better hope. <laughs> there's a better covenant. And there's a better country. This world is not all there is. There's a better place waiting on me. And I'm going there not because I've been good, but because Jesus loves me. Are you going with me? Let's stand together all around the church tonight. As we stand, if we're able, let's stand heads bowed while they come get us a song. I'm thankful for that better country. I'm thankful. For that better covenant. And I'm thankful for that better confidence. Confidence that I. Not in me. But in Jesus. Where's your confidence tonight? Is your hope in Jesus? If not put your hope in Jesus. Where's your hope for tomorrow? What you've got to face tomorrow. Put it in Jesus. Put it in Jesus. Are you relying on being good to get you to heaven? Listen to me. It won't work. It'll never work. Jesus died on the cross and God let him. If God didn't rescue Jesus off that cross, he is not going to give you a pass. Jesus died so that we might, through faith, believe on him, be saved. Father, tonight we just bow into your presence and we ask you that you'll help our hearts. Prepare everyone to be ready. And God, we're thankful that you gave us a better thing. That you gave us Jesus. That we don't have to rely on human goodness and good deeds to be right with you. That through Christ and through his blood, we have made nigh. So, Lord, tonight, if there's any in the place, if there's any that have not come under that blood, if there's any who have not come to Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, I pray that they'll come, that they'll come and receive that and be saved and born again. Ask Christ into their heart that they might be forgiven. And, Lord, help us to remember that there's better waiting on us. This is not our home. This is not our forever home. We're just here for a little while. We're pilgrims in a foreign land, strangers. In a foreign land. But one day we'll come home. But God until then help us to be faithful. And Lord tonight if there's burdens. If there's needs of prayer. Whatever it needs, uh, whatever needs to be. Let it be. And we'll pray in Jesus name. Amen.